Thank you. I love that song. Turn with me, please, to Matthew 25. This is the last section of Jesus' teaching in the book of Matthew before we enter the passion narrative. The passion, by that term, we mean Jesus' suffering and death by which he accomplished our salvation. Over these last two chapters, Jesus has been preparing us for the end, giving us signs of his own return, signs of the end of the age. There have been many warnings, many prophecies. And last week, we looked at two parables, the parable of the 10 young women and the parable of the 10 talents. This morning, we'll look at just one parable, finishing up this section. This, is, this parable is often called the parable of the sheep and the goats. It's a parable that continues the theme of preparing us, of making sure that we are ready for the day of final judgment. But within that same context that we've seen over the last two chapters, this parable's application takes us in a very specific direction, one that Jesus really hasn't touched on yet in this section. Even as we wait for Jesus' return and live lives that bring reward instead of punishment when he comes to judge the earth, look here at Jesus' clear and specific expectations of how we will live. Matthew 25, pick up in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty. And you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So Jesus has been consistently preparing us in chapters 24 and 25 for his own return, for the last days of this earth. This parable here at the end has a much more obvious meaning and interpretation than many other parables. Uh, the symbolism in this one is very thin. That's, that's not a negative op- observation at all. It's just a different way of presenting the material, presenting the teaching. Jesus even identifies himself very clearly within the parable and uses titles Son of Man, King, and Lord. The parable very obviously presents the picture of the final judgment that Jesus will pronounce over every human life. The symbolic aspect of the parable comes from one simple comparison. Verse 32, he says, this will happen. Uh, uh, He himself will will separate them as a shepherd 
separates the sheep from the goats. It's a simile, this, this metaphorical idea of Jesus as a shepherd separating sheep and goats. Sheep on the right, verse 33 says, goats on the left. The right being the position of honor and blessing. About the shepherd performing this task, Michael Wilkins writes, quote, In most areas of the world, the issue of separating sheep from goats would never arise, since flocks are unlikely to mix. But in the land surrounding Palestine, they often run together, and native breeds can look alike in size, color, and shape. So shepherds in Jesus' time and place had to do this task. That shepherd is symbolic of Jesus in the final judgment. The rest of the section is presented directly. He really doesn't take that symbolism and run with it any further in the parable. He very clearly describes the final judgment in pretty much non-symbolic terms. Verse 31 is an echo of two other passages that we've already talked about. Look at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, the Son of Man is the term Jesus uses most for himself in all of the gospels when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne we've talked a lot in the book of matthew about daniel chapter 7 this really important old testament prophecy this vision that daniel had of the son of man coming before the ancient of days i think that's the son coming before the father and it says, the, the Son of Man is given a glorious kingdom, an everlasting dominion. And it talks about him coming on the clouds with power and glory. Similar language to what we see in this verse. We've actually already seen this mentioned in chapter 24, just a couple weeks ago. That's also an echo, echo of Daniel 7. Here it is. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. See the similarities? He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect, his chosen people, from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So you see, it's consistent. The Son of Man coming in power and glory, and the angels are there with him, just like our passage this morning begins. Through this reference to his future appearance and power and glory and authority, Jesus is telling us one more time in this section to prepare for his coming judgment. That's point number one. Prepare for Jesus' coming judgment. It's a, a repeated call in these chapters. Be ready. Be alert. We've seen these phrases over and over again. He will come in complete and total authority. In this book, the end of Matthew, after Jesus' resurrection, he will say, when he gives the Great Commission, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He will come in that full authority at the end. He has authority as God to begin with. Jesus is God. He has full authority that way. But second, especially as we finish up the book, Jesus has authority because he has won. He's won the victory. He's established his complete authority over every rival through his unmitigated victory at his death and resurrection. The resurrection in particular establishes Jesus' role as the judge of all. His resurrection that victory is tied to his role as coming judge. Paul makes that explicit in the book of Acts. When he's in Athens, speaking to the philosophers there, he says this in Acts 17, 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness, perfect judgment, by the man you could capitalize that him. By the man he has appointed, he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. He is the man that the Father appointed, having raised him from the dead to judge all. He's proven that this is the one because he's the only one who's conquered death. He died once. He will never have to deal with it again. He is victorious. And he died on our behalf. He was wrongly accused. 
He was unlawfully convicted. He was deliberately murdered. We said a few weeks ago that one day he's coming back to clear his name, so to speak. His name is holy and perfect and righteous. He was completely without sin. So the verdict against Jesus was wrong. Our, staff, our ministerial staff is reading a phenomenal book by John Stott called The Cross of Christ. In that book, he says this line, which fits with our passage. He says, the resurrection was the divine reversal of the human verdict. I love that way of putting it. Through the resurrection, God reversed that wrong ruling. You know how in our court system today, you might have a decision that's handed down. And the people who lose that case can appeal it to a higher court. And in some cases, the higher court strikes down the previous ruling, reverses it, sends it back, says, no, you were wrong because of this reason or these reasons. <laughs> and, and, and it's changed. The outcome is changed by that higher court. That's what has happened in the resurrection of Jesus. The court of jealous, envious, prideful Jewish religious leaders wrongfully convicted Jesus and Pontius Pilate cowardly went along with it. But a higher court, the highest court of all, has reversed that verdict. Jesus has won. He has conquered Satan and sin and death and hell. And he has been appointed the judge of all by his heavenly father. So be ready, it says. Get right with Jesus Trust in him alone for salvation, if you never have. And live your life in such a way that you receive heavenly rewards, like the sheep, not the judgment of fire, like the goats in this passage. Be prepared. I read a story just a couple of weeks ago. This is from Euronews.com. It was about a very large fire station in Germany. And it opened less than a year ago. The article says this. A fire broke out early Wednesday morning at the Stadtallendorf fire station in Hesse, in Germany, and destroyed the equipment hall, the whole fire station, and almost a dozen emergency vehicles. Those fire trucks, those are very expensive. Initial estimates put the damage at between 20 million and 24 million euros, so up to about 26 million dollars. No one was injured, thank God. It says the fire broke out on an emergency vehicle belonging to the fire department, which contained lithium ion batteries and an external power connection. Local officials told the German news agency DPA that no fire alarm system was installed in the building because experts had considered it not necessary. Much to the astonishment of many observers now that the station has burned down. There are kind of lots of layers to that story, aren't there? Potentially $26 million in damage from fire at a place built for the purpose of fire prevention and putting out fires. And they thought a few fire alarms weren't necessary when this level of assets are sitting under that roof. They made the wrong choice, clearly, in not being prepared. It's, it's ironic. It's tragic. In this case, no lives were lost. But in our passage, it's your very soul at stake. Don't make the wrong choice. Don't be unprepared. Don't make assumptions. These people assume everything's going to be fine. There's a lot of fire trucks there. It'll be fine. Sometimes we assume about our souls without making sure we're right with God through Christ. Don't be unprepared when Jesus returns or when your life ends. Don't be lazy about it. Don't be distracted. Don't be faithless. Choose to trust in and follow Jesus before it's too late. Now it might be easy to look at this parable and think that the way we live on this earth can earn our way into heaven. When you look at the parables, the ones who have acted a certain way in this parable, the sheep, are sent to the right of Jesus, the place of honor and blessing. They're called into the kingdom. They're called to eternal life. And the ones who have neglected to live that way, the goats, are sent to the left of Jesus, as verse 46 says, away into eternal punishment. So you might wonder, does this parable teach a works-based salvation? I think it's good to wrestle with that when you read a passage like this. 
And the best way to wrestle through difficult passages or passages that raise questions in your mind are to look at other Bible passages. The Bible is its own best commentary. I mean, commentaries written by men or, and women are helpful, but the Bible is written by God, <laughs> all of it. So you know you're getting the right authority. You know you're getting absolute truth. So when you come to a passage that raises that question, look at other passages. And one that comes to mind with regard to this is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. that says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we know, I mean, and there's lots of other examples of that principle that we could give. Of salvation is by grace alone through trusting in the work that Jesus already did. So we have to wrestle with this. What, what does he mean here? I think if you look closely enough, this passage also teaches that we're brought into relationship with God by grace as well. It doesn't teach us that we can earn our salvation. It teaches, number two, that we should live differently in light of the Father's blessing of grace. In light of the gifts of salvation, that's why we do these good works. That's why we care for the needy, as he talks about in this passage. Because of what God has given us in Christ. Not in order to earn our way into his, his favor. We can't. Nothing we could do could earn that. Live differently in light of the Father's blessing of grace. We don't do good works in order to earn our salvation. That is contrary, by the way, to what many people in America and many people in the Bible Belt believe. Many people around us, maybe some in this room, think that the way to go to heaven is to just have your good outweigh your bad on some cosmic scale up in heaven. If I could just have more good actions, then I'm in. That is not how it works. Number one, no sinner can dwell with God. One sin separates us from God forever. Number two, for all of us, our bad would vastly outweigh our good. All of us. Often even our best actions are taken with bad motives, which taint them. Scripture in the book of Isaiah says our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. If we could earn our way to heaven, Jesus would not have needed to come to earth. Why did he come if we could make our own way? Instead, instead of that wrong understanding of salvation, we are taught in Scripture that our works are done, holiness, obedience to God, helping others, blessing others, as he talks about here, those are all done in light of God's salvation, as a result of God's gracious blessings on us. And I think you see this in a couple places in verse 34. Notice what he says. Before he mentions what they've done, he says, Come you who are blessed by my Father. Notice that? You're blessed. You're given something. He doesn't say, Come you who have earned your payment from my Father. Or gotten what you deserved. Come on in. You, you've earned it. No. You who are blessed. You're receiving a gift of grace. A blessing. Second, he says in that same verse, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Actually, I literally just thought of this. That word inheritance, I think, implies his grace too. You don't work for an inheritance. Right? It's a gift from you know, someone in your family who's passed away. It's not something you've earned through a job. But also, he says, this is the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So, they were chosen to receive this gift before they ever existed. They didn't earn it. It was decided, it was designated for them, for God's children, before they were ever created. It's not dependent upon their actions, their charity to others, their worship, their obedience, or their holiness. Paul says this explicitly in Ephesians 1. For he chose us in him. That's the Father choosing you, God's, one of God's people, in the Son. He chose Christians in the Son, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, before He created, to be holy and blameless in love before Him. He predestined us, He chose it before, to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, not because we earned it, 
not because we deserved it, to the praise of his glorious grace, a gift you don't deserve, that he lavished on us in the beloved one, in Jesus. Don't stumble over those words predestined and God choosing us. They're in the Bible. I still believe, by the way, that we're responsible to respond to the message of the gospel. When it's preached to us, responding with faith. And we're still called to share the gospel with everyone. But I've told you this before. No one chooses to follow Jesus unless Jesus has first chosen them. Unless the Holy Spirit comes and opens their eyes to their need for a Savior and the fact that Jesus is that only Savior. He initiates it. And it's not until after Jesus mentions that that the kingdom of God has been graciously prepared for them before the world was made, that he then mentions the way that they've lived. Always remember that. We don't do good works in order to earn God's salvation or climb our way to heaven. We do good works because of God's salvation. Out of the new reality of our redemption, out of the new nature, the new heart that he's given us in Christ through the Holy Spirit, we do good works out of thanksgiving and worship and gratitude. Christy and I encourage our kids to do their best in school for several reasons. Obviously, taking advantage of a good education will benefit them their entire lives. But we also tell them that the work that they do at school is a representation of who they are. It's a representation of the Crawford family. And most importantly, it's a way to honor God. Now, when my kids do work hard in school and do well, it doesn't change their status with me. If they put forth zero effort and get all Fs, as upset as I would be about that, I would still love them. They would still be my sons and daughters forever. They are not earning their relationship with me and their mother through their schoolwork. They aren't earning the fact of being a Crawford through that. They aren't earning their relationship with God through it either. But if they're doing things the right way, they're doing their best in school because of who they are. Because they have self-respect and want to live a meaningful life. They do their best. Because they're Crawfords and want to honor the family name well. They work hard. And most importantly, because they know that God made them. He placed his image on them to reflect himself. He gave them gifts and talents and abilities. And Jesus has saved them and called them to live differently because of his grace and love. Because of those reasons, they should do their best in school and all of their endeavors out of those realities. Don't get the cart before the horse. We are saved by God's grace. We are saved by faith. But as the book of James says, faith without works is dead. True, saving faith always shows itself in our works. Those who are sent to the left in this story, the goats, separated from God forever, are not cut off from salvation because they fail to care for the needy. Their lack of care for the needy proved their lack of faith in Jesus, demonstrated it. Their actions, or lack thereof, demonstrated that they did not belong to God's people. They were not part of his flock. And conversely, flip side, those who went to the right, the sheep, did not thus earn their way into heaven by the way they treated the needy. They showed the work of Jesus in them through the way they extended his love. I think that takes into account all that the Bible teaches about the gospel and the difference it makes in our lives in this passage jesus is concerned about good works on behalf of a particular group particular part of society and that concern should be an encouragement to us especially when we feel left out or hurting or hopeless 
Number three, be encouraged by Jesus' identification with and care for the needy. Those two parts. He identifies with the needy, the outcasts in society, and he cares about them. That should encourage us. should encourage everyone. <laughs> this past week I had lunch with Jerry Ellis and Steve Green and Taz Smith. Jerry's going to be ordained as a deacon next month. Jerry was a football coach for his whole career. He's had a huge impact on the lives of countless young men. I think it's a bit ironic that his son, Khan, I have this whole story and they're not sitting in their normal spot today. So. But <laughs> the story would have been better if that, in that case. But it just, it's funny to me that his son, Khan, turned out to be a football referee. I don't know how coaches and referees typically don't get along that well, but I guess it worked out for them. At lunch last week, Jerry told us about a phone call he got when he used to attend another church here in the area. Someone at that church he knew had been out to the local prison. And there he had met a young man who said he knew Jerry. And he asked him, we tell Jerry hello for me. And this man who on the phone had visited the, the prisoner, he seemed sort of incredulous with Jerry, almost judgmental, like, you know this guy in the prison? Like, you'd be associated with that guy? And Jerry was like, yeah. He's one of my players on my team. I'll still claim him. <laughs> For Jerry, it didn't matter what the young man had done. He still cared about him. He wouldn't cast him off or claim to not know or love him. People in prison need love and care too. Jesus here cares about people that other people like to cast out. There are several categories of need here that he talks about starting in verse 35. He first talks about hunger and thirst. He's talking about people who are short on physical sustenance, short on basic needs. And the reality is, as secure as we might feel, we all have those needs. Sometimes we feel very secure of, in our supply of them in America, but life could come at you fast. You remember supply chain problems during COVID? You remember like two weeks ago here when there was all the news about the longshoremen striking and all of a sudden you couldn't find toilet paper? We are all so dependent upon God to supply our basic needs each moment. Let me think about people, you know, my sister lives out in Colorado. Those folks, you, you know, you, you got to keep, during the winter, you got to keep basic supplies in your car in case you go off and do a snowbank. I mean, we, we, we are fragile. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a call to humility there, but it's a reminder that Jesus cares about those who lack basic needs. The next one he lists is those who are strangers, they're unknown, they're lonely. Have you ever been in a place where nobody knows you and felt the loneliness and emptiness of that? I, I think about like being in an airport late at night. It just feels weird, like you're on another planet or something. I had a flight canceled a few years back and I had to, I was supposed to get home that night and I had to stay in a hotel after a late night layover. And riding the shuttle with the driver and just one other passenger it just felt so bizarre. And I go into a hotel room. I got to, you know, the clothes that I'm wearing that day for my trip. I got to wear the next day. But it's just sad and lonely. That doesn't happen for me very often. But there are people for whom that is their normal, everyday existence. Jesus cares about them and wants us to care about them. Naked is next. Someone who's unclothed. That's, that's humiliating. It might be cold. Again, this is a basic need that some people around the world lack. Jesus cares about them. Jesus himself was likely stripped naked before his own crucifixion, adding to the shame. But it also added to his ability to sympathize with those in need. Next is sickness. Those who are unhealthy, their bodies broken in some way, their everyday life hard because their bodies aren't working right 
Jesus cares. Jesus endured sickness during his regular life. And then he was beaten before his death. And then scripture says his body was broken. Last week we celebrated the Lord's Supper. The bread, breaking of the bread reminds us of what he went through. His body being broken for us. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He didn't just carry our sin and guilt on the cross. He carried our sicknesses and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. And then lastly, prison. Again, another form of being alone, being neglected, of cut off from loved ones, cut off from society in general, cut off from freedom, from normal human existence. Accused and convicted. Jesus went through that even though he was perfectly innocent. And even though he was sinless, he identifies with people in prison, even the guilty ones. Because he bore our guilt. Scripture says he carried it for us. He knows what that feels like. He knows and he cares. He even identifies with these people. Think of how Jesus loved and even touched the lepers before he healed them. Whatever your particular need or problem or struggle or difficulty or burden, Jesus cares. Jesus identifies with those whom the world calls the least. The least of these, he says. The world might see them as least or less than, but not Jesus. He sees you. He loves you. He came to die for you. And he teaches us here an amazing truth. He so closely identifies with those who are outcast that for us to love them is to love him. Last point, care for Jesus by caring for your brothers and sisters in need. Care for Jesus by caring for your brothers and sisters in need. Now, why why did I use that phrase, brothers and sisters? It's because of verse 40. The king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I think that teaches us here that the primary, hear me, primary application is taking care of other Christians. Taking care of those within the household of faith who are in need. Even if others might want to ignore them. Even if taking care of them might be a heavy burden sometimes. Even if they have dealt with painful trauma that sometimes causes them to lash out against those who are trying to help them. Jesus sends us into those places, those situations, with those people whom he deeply loves and identifies with. The least of these. To be clear though, I think the application of this parable includes helping anyone in need, whether they're Christian or not. He definitely wouldn't tell us to limit our help to only those who are Christians. Paul addresses this, Galatians 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all. Work for the good of all. Notice here's the, he gives us a priority here. Especially for those who belong to the household of faith. So as the church, we are called to care first for those within the body of Christ. And then we're to help others as God gives us opportunities and opens doors to do so. There is plenty of need in our city. Let's not shy away from darkness or pain or difficulty. Let's be used by Jesus to bring light and love to hurting and lonely and needy people. Many of you are already doing that. Many of us have been involved at the Memphis Ministry Center over in Raleigh, serving through Send Relief. I think we need to continue that partnership. Many of you serve at Brinkley Heights on a regular basis, and you give to their food drives. Some of you serve through Arise to Read, helping those who struggle with literacy learn how to read. Our benevolence offering that Warren mentioned, this past month we did it for hurricane relief but on a monthly basis as you give to that it enables us to help many people and we especially last couple weeks we've got a ton of requests people have come in press on in those things expand in those things and be ready for opportunities that God gives you as an individual out in our community to help people around you as well Jesus calls us to show up 
to be there for those who are hungry and thirsty and estranged and naked and sick and in prison. My wife was recently reading a book by the columnist David Brooks called How to Know a Person. Brooks tells this story. He says, a person who is good at accompaniment understands the art of presence. Presence is about showing up. Showing up at weddings and funerals. And especially showing up when somebody is grieving or has been laid off or has suffered some setback or humiliation. When someone is going through a hard time, you don't need to say some wise thing. You just have to be there with heightened awareness of what they're experiencing at that moment. He continues, I recently read about a professor named Nancy Abernathy who was teaching first year med students, leading a seminar on decision-making skills when her husband at age 50 died of a heart attack. With some difficulty, she managed to make it through the semester and carried on with her teaching. One day she mentioned to the class that she was dreading teaching the same course the next year because each year during one of the first sections of the course she asked everybody to bring in family photos so they can get to know one another. She wasn't sure if she could share a photo of her late husband during that session without weeping. The course ended. Summer came and went and fall arrived and with it the day she dreaded. The professor entered the lecture hall full of trepidation and sensed something strange. The room was too full. Sitting there along with her current class were the second year students, the ones who had taken her class a year before. They had come simply to lend their presence during this hard session. They knew exactly what she needed and didn't need to offer anything more. This is compassion, Abernathy later remarked. A simple human connection between the, between the one who suffers and one who would heal. Jesus is full of compassion. He shows up for those in need. He doesn't leave them alone. He has shown up and shown his love through his sacrifice on the cross. And he continues to show up every day for those in need both in his care and provision and through the love that he sends us to show. We are called to extend his love. And get this, as we end this big section on being prepared for Jesus' return in the end, when Jesus judges our lives on the last day in perfect justice, he will look at how we treated those who had no standing and no ability to pay us back. And he will treat our actions toward them as actions toward himself. Pray with me. Father, I ask that you would help us to take this message. Help me to take this message to heart. You have been so generous in sending your son for us. You've been generous in giving us life and providing for us. Everything we have is from your hand. We are not self-sufficient. We need you. We need every breath, each moment. We know it's a gift from you. And we receive it with gladness and thanksgiving. Our basic needs come from you. Lord, we acknowledge that and we ask that you would help us to be open-handed with these gifts. Giving back to you and giving to each other giving to brothers and sisters, giving to people in our community who are in need. And Lord, we trust what you say in this passage, that as we give to others, the least of these in in our society's eyes, we are giving to you. We're caring for you. And we look to your rewards for that. God, we're not looking to rewards in this life. We know everything in this life is fleeting. And it will not go with us. We want to live in light of eternity. Help us to do that, Lord. May we live generous lives out of gratitude. Not trying to earn our way to salvation. We know we can't do that. But out of thanksgiving for your love and mercy and grace. Lord, if there are any here 
or any watching online who have not received Christ and known his love, may they receive him today. And may you use us to show your love to our community and world. May we draw closer to you as a result of this passage. In Jesus' name, amen.